a few weeks ago, I was in Thailand. And while I was there, I went to pay my respects to Ajahn Uthai, student of Ajahn Phan. When I arrived, there was already a group of lay people visiting with him. He asked me a couple of questions about life here at Wat Mai Ta. And one of them was, when Westerners come to the monastery, what do they come for? And he had been talking about virtue and generosity to the lay people. And I mentioned to him that a lot of people don't come thinking about generosity and virtue at the very beginning. Their first motivation for coming is to find peace of mind. And one of the people in the other group said, ah, Westerners, they go straight for the top right from the very beginning. And John Otai's response is, what do you mean straight to the top? Even common animals want peace of mind. If you want to be a human being, you have to develop virtue, good qualities in the mind, good qualities of the character. That's what differentiates us from common animals. It's one of those good qualities. There's a list in the perfections, which include discernment, which is a quality of the mind. But the other nine are all qualities of the heart. You've got generosity, virtue, renunciation, persistence, endurance, truth, determination, goodwill, equanimity. Goodwill stands out as good-heartedness. A lot of the others, though, are qualities of strength. And goodness requires strength. Because you start out with good intentions, but if you can't carry them through, they don't really mean much. And it requires strength to do the things that sometimes you don't want to do, but you realize they're going to be good for you in the long term. Or to say no to things that you like to do, but you know are going to be bad for you in the long term. In other words, your discernment points out the fact that the consequences are going to be good or bad for certain actions. And then you've got to look at your emotions. Are they on the side of what your discernment is telling you or not? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. When they're on the side of your, your discernment, then it's no real problem. It's when they're at cross-purposes. That's when it's a real test of your character. That's how we measure our self-worth. As the Buddha said, a sign of your discernment as a mature person is your ability to make yourself want to do things that you don't like doing but will give good results in the long term, and to want to say no to things that you like doing but are going to give re bad, bad results in the long term. So notice you're not just going against your likes, you're trying to change your likes. Trying to make yourself want to do these things. So you have to be able to point out to yourself what are the good consequences and how happy you'll be when the good consequences come. This is one of the reasons why we begin with generosity in the practice. It's practice in delayed gratification. And also the realization that some pleasures are better than others. The pleasure that comes from seeing someone else enjoy something you gave to them is a better pleasure than simply enjoying it yourself. Or the simple knowledge that you've done something good is a better pleasure than the pleasure that comes from just gobbling up what you've got. Notice that there is pleasure here. All too often we're told that to be a good person you have to deny your own happiness for the sake of other people's. But then, after all, you start wondering, well, why is their happiness more important than yours? And from the Buddhist point of view, the person who works for his or her own well-being and the well-being of others at the same time, that's the best person. So you've got to learn how to find your happiness in being good at the same time. You do things for goodness' sake and also for happiness' sake, together. We have that phrase in English, for goodness' sake. And it's been repeated so many times that it's just a matter of emphasis. It's lost its real meaning. The real meaning is you do something because it will be good.
I say you want to learn how to get your likes in line with what's good. It's one of the reasons why we meditate. Not just to give the mind a peaceful place to stay, but also to give it strength. This goodness is going to require endurance, and it's going to require determination. It's going to require persistence. And if we don't have any internal strength like this, any source for internal strength, it's going to be difficult to carry through with our good intentions. And so this is why concentration is not only one aspect of the path, but the Buddha placed it at the center of the path to try to get your heart well rested, get your mind well rested, with a sense of well-being, a sense of ease, a sense of rapture. And these are things that you can do. As I mentioned last night, I was at a place in Malaysia where I was told that people had been taught that you can't do concentration, it just kind of happens on its own, kind of comes up and whacks you across the head. You just have to sit there very patiently waiting for it to come. But the first jhana contains direct a thought and evaluation. These are things you do. You direct your thoughts to the breath and then you evaluate it. How does it feel? Does it feel good enough to stay with for a while? And if it doesn't, how could it be made to feel that good? You experiment. You try things out. You ask questions. You look for answers. These are all things you do. And then when you find something that seems good, you can stick with it for a while to see if it really is good or how long it's going to be good. And when you find a way of breathing that feels good, you allow that sense of pleasure to spread through the body, down the spine, out the legs, down the nerves to the arms, starting from the area around the heart, down through the different organs and down to the intestines. Try to sensitize yourself. The more sensitive you are to this area of awareness, the more satisfying it becomes. You make yourself sensitive and then you breathe in a way that satisfies that sensitivity. And you find you develop a pleasure that's more and more refined. It's a pleasure that's good in and of itself, but it's also good in the sense that it's not harming anybody. And it gives you the strength to look at the questions you ask yourself as you go through daily life about what to do, what you should be done. This is a basic distinction in the Buddha's teachings. We hear so much about the Buddha's teachings on non-duality or his avoidance of dualities. But one of his duties as a teacher, he said, was to give you a basis for deciding what should be done. And part of that starts with just the basic principle that your actions really do matter. They make a difference. You have the choice to act in one way or another. If you were to deny that choice, or to deny that your actions had consequences, then there wouldn't be any idea of should or should not. You just act on your impulses. But you do have choices, and actions do have consequences. So if you want true happiness, that's the condition for the Buddhist shoulds. And you want to be very careful about what you do. And then ask yourself, do I want to do what I should be doing? And this is where you have to learn how to talk to yourself. Make yourself see the goodness that comes, the happiness that comes from doing the right thing. And part of that happiness is a sense of self-worth. People who indulge in all their impulses after a while have very little sense of self-worth at all. They have to make an inflated sense of self-worth that doesn't really have anything to do with reality. But if you can look at your actions and see, I did this and nobody was harmed. I found happiness this way, nobody was harmed. I found happiness in this way and other people benefited too. That kind of realization gives you a sense of well-being, of worth as a person. And there's a lot of well-being that comes around that sense of worth. 
You want to learn how to appreciate it. This means changing the balance of power inside. There are some voices in the mental committee that are rebellious. But when you follow them, where do they lead? A lot of them are like the friends who try to get you to do something against the law, and then when the police come, they go running away. In other words, something inside you wants to do something unskillful, and you give in. And that particular defilement is not the one that's going to suffer. You're the one that's going to suffer. So you have to see the value of being able to look back on your actions and realize nobody was harmed. There are cases where people were helped. And that's your value as a human being. That's your value as a mature human being. So this is one of the reasons why we come, for goodness sake, to figure out what would be the good thing to do so that we can regard ourselves as good people. So look at that list in the perfections, endurance, per determination, renunciation. Renunciation there doesn't mean just giving things up. Every case where the Buddha talks about renouncing something, he said, there's always something that's gained in return. And the primary case of renunciation is just sitting here, giving up your sensual thoughts, learning how to focus on the breath, focus on the sense of the body as you feel it from within, and learning how to find pleasure there. Because that kind of search for pleasure really is strengthening. The sense for pleasure is outside, or the fascination with thinking about what a wonderful meal that was you had and how the next meal is going to be really good. It really weakens you. It makes your happiness depend on things being a certain way. You become a hothouse plant. You can live only under certain conditions. Your happiness can survive only under certain conditions. Whereas if you learn how to find happiness with a breath, you can be anywhere. sitting on a bus in a doctor's office. They can throw you in prison. You can learn how to breathe well. And you'll have your own personal sense of well-being, a source of well-being, that nobody can take away from you. That gives you strength, because you can put up with all kinds of conditions that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And your goodness can survive all kinds of conditions because of that. So we're here for peace of mind, but it's a peace of mind that is also goodness, happiness and goodness together. That's what makes it really special. I mean, anybody can find peace of mind in just about any way, but when you add those extra conditions onto it, it makes it something of real value. Because you've learned how to find your happiness in a responsible way. You can look at your actions and not see anything that you would criticize yourself for. That means your peace of mind doesn't have to put up huge walls of denial. It's also a peace of mind that can withstand all kinds of external changes. Because you've made certain qualities in your mind unchanging. So think of the all-around aspect of the goodness that we're looking for, goodness and happiness together. And there is the peace of mind that comes from that. After all, release is the ultimate peace. That's the kind of peace that common animals can't find, but human beings can. Because the release the Buddha taught depends on all the factors of the path, which include virtue. And as he said, they're founded on generosity. Stingy people, he said, cannot attain jhana, cannot attain nirvana. In other words, that's a kind of peace that's allowed or available only to generous people, virtuous people.
So yes, we are looking for peace of mind, but we've got some extra conditions. We're doing it for the sake of happiness, and we're also doing it for goodness sake. So always keep these many dimensions in mind, because they're what makes the practice whole, an entire practice, and a practice that really is worth giving your life to.